Hello, and welcome to our first ever Spectrum Health School Health Virtual Series. I'm Dr. Lisa Lowry, Section Chief of Adolescent Medicine at Helen DeVos Children's Hospital. This virtual chat. In this virtual chat, you will be connecting with community experts to answer the questions that are most important to you regarding COVID-19 and the back to school season, whether your back to school season is in person or virtual. In this first session, we'll be focused on classroom activities and team sports, practicing healthy behaviors. Our experts will discuss reducing risk and staying healthy to prevent the spread of COVID-19 at our schools, on the field, or at home. As the local leader in health, we at Spectrum Health, we're looking forward to answering your questions and having a healthy discussion on the topics that matter to you most. We want to hear from you. So please post your questions in the comment section on whatever social platform you are joining us this evening. We will be recording this event to share for those who could not join us live. To kick off this first evening, I will share, we will start with sharing some observations from our panelists, um, and I will turn it over to my fellow panelists. I will have each of them introduce themselves, name, title, and brief observations of the school year so far. We're going to start with Dr. Russ Lampin. Hi, good evening. My name is Russ Lampin. I'm an adult infectious disease physician at Spectrum Health. I'm also the medical director of infection prevention at Spectrum Health, which means I've been spending a lot of time these last six months trying to figure out ways to keep our employees safe, but also to keep patients as they enter our healthcare system safe, both in the hospitals and in the clinics. Um, outside from that, I think I've given uh, both formal and informal advice to churches, coffee shops, sports teams, uh, and, and numerous people looking for travel advice, uh, different different uh, measures that should be taken, and thoughts and considerations um, as they try to create some normalcy around COVID. Um, as far as the school year goes, I actually have two, uh, two daughters at East Grand Rapids High School, and uh, they're in a hybrid model where they attend school half the day and are uh, virtual the remainder of the day. And I've actually been pretty impressed with how things have been handled uh, and pleasantly surprised really at the, the minimal disruption that's occurred so far. So I think I, I've been impressed and at least as I've looked around and I've paid pretty close attention to um, outbreaks, some of it just through word of mouth, but also through uh, reporting uh, to, in all honesty, how, how, how minimal I think the disruptions have been. And I guess the other thing that I've been really happy with the school system uh, and the, the state actually is the resumption of sports. And I know that there have been some um, maybe complaints related to how some of the sports are rolled out, but I, I really have been happy that that for the most part, they've been able to get those uh, activities going as well. And, and again, haven't seen too many complications associated with them. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Lampin. Next, Dr. Philip Adler. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Lauer. Appreciate that. My name is Philip Adler. I'm the manager of our sports medicine and athletic training outreach program and an athletic trainer by training. Um, really have spent quite a bit of time um, with my staff since June 8, uh, helping to prepare them to prepare their athletes and parents and athletic administration to get back to athletics. First, we learned how to do it safely. Um, how do we clean things? What do we clean things with? How do we wear masks appropriately? Uh, and once we figured out how to educate and, and teach people how to do that, um, we got to move into the next phase. And so I've really been impressed with um, the athletic trainers across West Michigan and the collaboration between them, regardless of who their employer is. I've been particularly impressed with my athletic training staff and the amount of time they've spent with coaches uh, and parents, educating them about how to um, best uh, prepare safely for sports. And, and I'm also very appreciative of the way the MHSAA has rolled out um, the safety precautions and the guidelines for sports and, and the things they're doing to help protect the kids. Um, it's, it's really made our jobs a, a lot easier to have some of these uh, really specific guidelines to follow. And, and what we've seen most frequently is when those coaches and parents are helping to reinforce those guidelines, the students are really following suit. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Adam London. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, uh, Dr. Lowry. Dr. Adam London, Director of the Kent County Health Department. And my early observation has been 
that our community has done a tremendous job of working together in order to plan for this fall. And in particular, our superintendents, such as Scott Smith and Heidi Katula and so many others have been working very carefully with us at the Kent County Health Department, with Spectrum Health, and with so many others to make sure that the plans in place for this fall would allow for the best education possible while doing it in the safest way possible. And that's been quite an undertaking for all of us. And so far, we believe it has been effective. While we know that there's going to be cases and we expect that, uh, as of last Friday, we had seen 106 cases uh, in Kent County schools, uh, but only about 10 of those actually involved more than one student. The vast majority were individuals and the vast majority of those individual cases had known contacts with cases outside the school setting. So we're very pleased thus far uh, to see the plans that have been put into place so painstaking, painstakingly uh, and with so much care uh, seem to be working so far. But we know it's very early and we want everyone to really focus on what they can do going forward to make sure that the success continues and that we can see education continue in the safest way possible. Awesome. Great. Yes, I think that's we all want to be successful. Next, we have Dr. Heidi Katula. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Lowry, for introducing me and, and to everyone on the panel this evening. Um, I'm the superintendent in East Grand Rapids Public Schools. Uh, myself and Scott Smith have worked very closely with Spectrum since uh, early June and July as we worked on creating the Return to School Guide. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have the support of Spectrum Health as well as all of the different people, as Dr. London mentioned, come together through this crisis. Uh, we're deeply grateful to the Kent County Health Department and all of the collaboration that has come out through all support groups. And I think the one thing I've been the most uh, surprised by or um, as well as proud of is how well our students have responded. Mm -hmm. Our students through all of this uh, are very resilient, very much want to be back in school with their peers. We'll do whatever it takes to be able to come to school, to play athletics, to be back into a normal life for their high school, middle school, or elementary experience. And so thank you again for having me. And I look forward to being here this evening. Awesome. And then our last panelist, Mr. Scott Smith. Good evening. And thank you, Dr. Lowry. Uh, as the other panelists have shared, uh, this has been a tremendous challenge from the onset. Uh, our goal uh, in Cedar Springs has been to really respond in, in such a way that we don't find ourselves overreacting due to panic or anxiety. We're not underreacting out of apathy nor ignorance. We are acting appropriately and acting thoughtfully, uh, being guided by science and the experts in the field. And as Dr. Katula shared, without the partnerships uh, in place between Spectrum Health and the county uh, school districts, and also with the dynamic support of the Kent County Health Department, um, we would be in, in, in a real uh, tough position. But with that guidance and with that support, uh, as Dr. Katula said, it's it's been phenomenal to see students back on campus and once again, engaging in the learning process. Each day is a gift and we are uh, just incredibly thankful for the energy that our staff is bringing to the table, um, the patience that people are embracing these times with because we know that we're not going to get it right uh, every time, uh, right out of the gate. Uh, but there's been just a tremendous amount of patience, a tremendous amount of grace, and a just a can-do spirit that uh, continues to help us uh, make gains each and every day. And so we're just incredibly thankful for that opportunity, and I'm thankful for this opportunity to be a part of this panel. Well, this is great. Thank you so much to my panelists. And um, I think this this crisis, this this COVID pandemic, has been just a testament to the, the 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 courage and the resilience of our communities. So again, please feel free to send us those questions. But I'm going to start off with some questions for our panelists, and this one's going to be for Russ. Russ, uh, Dr. Lampin, the new governor's executive orders, which are scheduled to take effect on October 5th state that all kids, regardless of age, must be masked while in school. And the question is, is this safe? 
Yeah, thanks. I just uh, just saw that it came out. I think uh, a couple days ago that that was released. I think this makes a lot of sense. I mean, when we look at um, data that continues to come out, looking at children and COVID nineteen infections, we see that kids, um, while they tend not to get as sick, I mean, they they tend not to have d the same disease severity that we see in older populations, they clearly can still be infected. And I think we know this from, from having kids in school that you know, it's very often the, the runny nose and the cold that comes from school and that kids bring it home. And so this, this executive order I think makes a lot of sense in, in recognizing that um, kids in school may actually be able to contract COVID and have minimal to no symptoms. Some studies would say as many as 15% uh, of of kids who get COVID have zero symptoms at all, um, and that they have the possibility to bring it back home to people that are more vulnerable and are more likely to develop complications. So uh, it's absolutely safe. There are plenty of studies to show that uh, masking doesn't reduce oxygen levels. It doesn't increase carbon dioxide levels. I think I think kids will have no problem wearing them. I think many kids are already getting used to wearing masks. And uh, this is an extension of, of the previous executive order because kids a lot of times have already been wearing masks in, in common spaces, they've been wearing them on the bus. And so this is just an extension of wearing them in the classroom. You know, I think there, there certainly will probably have to be some accommodations made and some breaks to kind of allow kids to get snacks and, and get a glass of water and so forth. But I, I think it's a smart move and, and certainly doesn't cause any harm to the, the students or the kids at all. Uh, and will likely bring some protection to other, other household contacts and other family members. Very good, very good point, thank you. Along with, um, sick kids. Uh, Scott Smith, this question is for you. Are you seeing sick kids or kids come to school sick? And what does it take to close down a school system? And I know you mentioned working collaboratively with the health department using some science, but can you comment on that, please? Sure. We actually have two partners at play here. Um, so we are seeing students in class uh, that uh, are showing symptoms of, of varying ailments, whether they be seasonal allergies or um, anxiety and, and nervousness uh, is that sometimes impacts the little students uh, in their tummies. But um, we have um, school health aides in place in each of our buildings. They're part of the Spectrum Health team uh, and they're actually serving in, uh, in our schools and partnering with our uh, office staffs, our principals, and our teachers to help clarify um, the dimension of this of the symptoms being uh, exhibited, but also then helping us uh, making sure that we're taking those steps, uh, clearly following the uh, toolkit that's been provided by the Kent County Health Department, and then informing and, and communicating out with families uh, as students need to uh, go home for further clarification. Uh, as to whether or not the symptoms are the result of seasonal allergies or some other condition, or if the symptoms are the result of COVID-19. And I think in terms of what will it take to, to shut down a district or shut down a building, it's not going to be as uh, challenging as calling a snow day. Um, you know, we're gonna rely on the Kent County Health Department and the data that they're collecting and maintaining around rates of infection and um, the pathways for infection, and we'll follow their guidance in terms of whether we need to actually uh, do a closure on a specific building or uh, the entire district for that matter. Mm, perfect, thank you. Kind of along that lines, and this question is gonna be for you, Dr. Katula. School districts must publish information about uh, any cases of a probable or confirmed COVID-19 positive individual present on school property or at a school function during the period of infection. What is your district's plan or um, what is, uh, how do you guys go about sharing this information? Thank you for that question. Each case or each situation is very unique. And we start first with the student or the parent, whoever brings the information to us regarding the positive test. And that's where it starts. Uh, once we have that information, then we go through a series of questions and the Kent County Health Department's been very helpful to guide us through those questions. And then we also reach out to the Kent County Health Department. Uh, through the toolkit, we've been provided with an, 
automatic way to list all of the close contacts, which would be anyone who is less than six feet for more than 15 minutes masked or unmasked. And then we provide that contact tracing spreadsheet to the Kent County Health Department, go through that entire process. Once that has occurred, then we also speak with the contact tracer who's been assigned and they affirm uh, the close contacts need to be notified. We work to notify the close contacts. Uh, we have to be very careful. Uh, we have to adhere to HIPAA as well as confidentiality, especially for any students or staff or anyone involved. Um, then we move further to communicate to any parents for any students who are close contacts or any staff who are close contacts, we communicate to those staff. Uh, there is also more reporting that's becoming uh, more available. The Michigan Department of Health and Human Services has now the outbreak page on the website, which shows uh, the different cases and how they're linked within a 28 day period. We also within Kent County are fortunate to have our intermediate school district, which publishes our county data on a COVID dashboard. And so those are a number of the different ways in which we communicate and, and somewhat of the algorithm that we go through when uh, we find out we have a positive case. Wow, all right, great, great information. So I'm actually gonna go back to the subject of masks. And this is a question, I know Dr. Lampin talked about wearing masks being safe, but, um, Dr. Adler, is it safe to wear a mask while practicing or playing sports? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Adler. I appreciate the question. And, and we get this quite a bit. Um, the answer unequivocally is, is yes. And, and of course, it's going to depend on the sport, right? And um, there's going to be some interesting innovations and modifications that take place. And we've already seen that happen. Um, football is a great example. As you see the evolution of uh, face masks and face shields, and we've moved from plastic, and we figured out that wearing the, um, the the mask and with the loops over the years doesn't quite work. You can't get over your head, and the gaiters weren't perfect either because every time you took your helmet off, you'd have to remember to pull things up. And so, it, there's a number of different apparatus, but um, what it comes down to is it's actually um, it's safe. Um, not heard of any um, literature, any studies, any significant issues for anybody. Uh, spent a little bit of time the last couple of days looking at research to try to find something that would invalidate the reason to wear a mask. And quite frankly, as we exhale and we start to exhale more frequently, your respirations increase and um, the opportunity to expel those, those droplets further out it's really a good idea to have that face covering to protect those people around you um, from that expelling of, of those air and those water droplets. And so um, I look forward to, to more innovation and, and things to come, but absolutely, uh, Dr. Lowry, it is safe to, to wear a mask. Perfect. So I know there, I have a question for Dr. London on vaccines, but I'm gonna come back to that and first ask a couple questions that come up in the chat since we talked a little bit about going to school and is it safe. Um, this was more a comment, but um, the Harvard Institute has Michigan in orange. Is it really a safe environment for in-person learning? Yeah, so safe is a, is a word that we wrestle with a lot in public health because uh, you know safe implies all absence of risk. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is there is a risk in going back to in-person instruction. There's also a risk in not having in-person instruction. And there's a risk, uh, risk that we accept for, for many things uh, in life. Uh, and so, you know, we believe right now that uh, the having in-person instruction is a lower risk activity based on what we have seen so far with the data, uh, based on what we know uh, mask use and disinfection and social distancing uh, can do to make that environment a uh, lower risk. Uh, we also know that if the kids aren't in school, there's risk of transmission for activities they may be involved in <clears throat> elsewhere uh, and so many other consequences to their health and their well being. So it's really a matter of balancing all of these issues and making sure that we're doing it in the lowest risk way uh, with the most uh, in mind for. Uh, for the benefit of our kids. So the other thing I know parents are concerned, yes, it's now and it's it's okay now because kids can kind of space out or maybe go outside. But what are your concerns? And this is for Dr. London about when we are in person and um, it's cold weather and numbers are still going up. Any concerns with that? Of course. Yeah, we're concerned. And from the very beginning, we've looked at, uh, you know, what are the major hurdles going to be 
between the beginning of this pandemic and the end of it when we have vaccine available. And among those hurdles we saw uh, going back to school in the fall and the colder weather are certainly things that are going to add risk, uh, but they're things that fortunately we had a lot of time to plan for. And we're watching the data very carefully. We have uh, algorithms and plans in place uh, that if things uh, start to go uh, in a direction that we don't wanna see, if we start to see that test positivity rate go way up, if we start to see that schools are having a hard time uh, managing uh, and reducing transmission within those schools, and if the schools themselves are becoming centers of transmission, then we're gonna have to do other things. Uh, but so far, what we've seen in the planning that we've done, uh, we believe has gotten us off to a good start. And we're gonna keep building on that with more testing, better surveillance, uh, and make sure that we can get through the school year uh, in, a, in a healthy, safe way. So I get, while I have you here, and then I'm gonna move on uh, to some of our other panelists, any insight on when the vaccine might be available? Yeah, so I wish I had some secret knowledge uh, about when we're going to get a, a shipment of vaccine. Uh, I don't have that kind of insight, but uh, what I do know is that we have three vaccine candidates, uh, the Moderna, the Pfizer, and the Johnson Johnson candidates that are all in phase three of clinical trials. Uh, and the AstraZeneca is not far behind. Uh, and that uh, once those clear that phase three trial, they'll go to FDA for, uh, for review for safety and for efficacy. And assuming that it passes that, uh, that review, it would be made available to, uh, to communities across the country. Uh, now, you know, what we're looking at is generally once it, the FDA receives uh, a candidate like that, it takes about a year for review. We know that's going to be uh, expedited in this case. I still think that probably three months is, is about the quickest that could be turned around. Uh, and I think it's probably realistic to be thinking about early 21, uh, maybe spring of 21 for really having a uh, vaccine available uh, in, a, in a wide, uh, in a wide basis. Okay, very good. So I have a question and I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Lampin and then also uh, Scott Smith to comment on this. How will lunch rooms be safe? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'll just start with a couple of things. So I think there's, there's the three C's people have, have phrased this of COVID transmission. And I think as we look at lunch spaces or any sort of educational space or any gathering space, we kind of have to think of these things that put people at increased risk for acquiring COVID. So crowded places, uh, enclosed spaces, and then close contact to individuals. And so when we look at the major outbreaks that have occurred, some of them, some of them locally, um, I, I point finger at my, my own alma mater in East Lansing with the Harper's Bar outbreak, right? It was an enclosed space that was crowded with people in close contact. And that, that combination of those three factors tends to be what really uh, fuels outbreaks. And it has been interesting as we've looked, and I've done more and more research too, I've yet to see an outbreak that's been associated with masked individuals. And I, I have found that that gives a lot of reassurance in the school setting and in the athletic setting. We just haven't seen big outbreaks. There certainly could be some transmission, but not massive outbreaks. And I think it's important as we look at COVID to think about all of the different things that we do as providing layers of safety. You know, no one intervention is bulletproof, right? So just because you're six feet away from somebody doesn't mean transmission can't occur. Just because you have a mask means it can't occur. But if we continue to kind of layer all these protective um, factors in place, we can really reduce transmission. And, you know, I think when we remember that the average person who is infected with COVID only spreads it to another two to three people. And I, I love this stat is that if we can get 60% of the population to wear a mask, 60% effective, we can get rid of COVID transmission, right? It's, wow. you know, it, it just it takes an effort. So, I mean, I know kids, you know, the lunchroom space I think is going to be complicated. Um, and I haven't looked at what every school is doing, but I know there's a lot of different strategies in place to try to spread kids out. And I think that's probably the intervention that's going to be the safest is to, to get kids to not have the same um, density as, as getting packed in. I know a lot of schools have kind of worked on creating, you know, sort of pods where your, your interactions with other students is limited. And so I, I'll, you know, I'll let, let Scott speak to that, but I think those are the types of interventions that are gonna be needed to keep that lunch space safe. Yeah, thank you, Dr. London. And, and you know, similarly, we have three C's as well. So one is the cleaning protocols. Um, then the second is uh, creative spaces. And then the third is uh, choices in terms of, of food choices. So first, in terms of 
cleaning, you know, just making sure that our students are practicing good hand washing um, procedures, both in and out of uh, the food service cafeteria area is, is very important to our efforts to uh, reduce the risk of transmission. A second piece is just making sure that we're, uh, you know, very thoughtful and very thorough in our cleaning protocols of the spaces within the cafeteria. Um, the second piece involves creatively identifying different spaces in our schools uh, where students can engage in, and eat their lunches. So for uh, in each of our buildings, we're providing students with spaces to eat outside, uh, weather permitting, uh, but also utilizing different spaces like gymnasiums and uh, libraries and hallways, uh, just really getting creative in terms of how we're using the buildings physically to help maximize that, uh, that physical distancing that we can maintain uh, between students. As Dr. London uh, commented, we're also utilizing pods um, in our students or with our grades K-5 uh, so that students are going down and we're creatively utilizing the schedule to have fewer students uh, eating lunch at any specific time. Uh, and then the third area in terms of choices, we're reducing some of the choices that we have, uh, that we're offering our students so that, that uh, the timing that they're spending is line in, in line is reduced, um, which is, uh, you know, maybe detrimental from, a, from a, a perspective of, you know, having variety at lunch, but it's able to, it's enabled us to be more efficient um, and to provide that food to students uh, with a high quality of, of, uh, of content, but also making it happen uh, more quickly, which is reducing the amount of time that students are spending in line. Great. Uh, Dr. Cthulhu, you want to comment any additional things that you are doing? I would agree uh, with what's been mentioned. Uh, we've been working with the lunch in the K-5. As Dr. Lampin mentioned earlier, we've been in the hybrid until now, and we will be moving forward towards reopening in the upcoming weeks. But to this point, K-5, uh, following those same practices, uh, the cleaning is, is a critical piece with our students, as well as the hand washing, uh, the sanitization of the spaces. But then also we have limited the food services so that it is, uh, kids don't take forever to eat. They eat pretty quickly and then they wanna get on to the next thing. And so once they do finish their meal, quickly remasking, we have seen tremendous success with the masking. We've seen our kids uh, we're really great about always making sure their mask is on and reapplying their mask once they're finished taking a drink or they're eating, um, but also really being creative in our spaces and trying to utilize that so that we're ensuring uh, as much space as possible can be between the students. Great. So there's another question that's come in from the chat, and this is open to uh, any of panelists. It said, um, why are some schools checking kids' temps when they arrive at school? I don't anyone like to comment on that. I mean, I could throw this out. Fever is a really uh, poor indicator to try to find people who have infections. So many people who have COVID lack uh, fever and fever defined as um, temperature greater than 100.4 degrees. And so um, it, it's better in some ways to to have people monitor their own sympt symptoms. And I know this goes a bit on the honor system, um, but subjective fever or feeling feverish is actually a more accurate predictor of COVID infection. Um, you're gonna find more people with COVID than if you check temperatures. And so, I mean, I think some of it is the, the logistics of trying to measure the temp of all these kids coming in and out of the school, but some of it is that you just miss so many cases if temperature is your only marker. Uh, that it just isn't worthwhile for the time and effort. And so I think the emphasis really has to be on making sure that people stay home if they feel sick. So paying attention to all those symptoms of body aches, feeling feverish, having chills, having a sore throat, having nasal congestion, loss of taste or smell, um, diarrhea. Those are the symptoms that kids have. And, and that's really what we need to be a pay, pay attention to and have a culture where kids who are sick stay home. You know, I know you know, there's, there's always this kind of uh, culture of, well, you just give the kids some Tylenol and send them to school and they'll probably be fine. Um, you know, that's not acceptable anymore. We, we can't do that. We have to pay attention to, to these symptoms and keep our kids home so that we're keeping everybody else safe in the school system. 
Perfect. I'm going to ask Dr. Adler to comment on this. I know because I get this from my patients. Like, I'm short of breath. I can't work out. Um, how, is there a sense of how long kids can wear a mask or work out before they need a break? And another question, is there one specific mask better than others? I know you talked about limiting infection with masks, but is there, like, should I wear a paper mask, you know, or yeah. just a cloth mask I made at home? Could you comment on that as well? Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a good question. And to your first point, I, I think it really goes to the individual. Uh, I think that you have to look at what what is your overall uh, tolerance of, of that mask. You may have to take more frequent breaks um, as you get used to the mask. It's also going to depend on the fabric that mask is made out of. How many layers are in that mask? Um, I know people who have three layer masks and, and add a carbon filter in it. Um, as a homemade mask. And, and sometimes it's just a really heavy uh, mask. And the difference between some of the synthetic materials versus the cottons um, and, and what have you, it's really going to depend on what you can be functional in, what's not going to impair your participation in your vision, um, and really what's going to create a good fit. Um, it doesn't do any good to put something over your face if it's flapping in the breeze, right? I mean, you see, I see people with bandanas and things and you might as well not wear anything because you're just flapping in the breeze, right? So having something that's secure, um, and I talk with my hands a lot, I love it. So, um, love it. you know, it, <laughs> it, 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 it's supposed to be fun, right? And, and I think we need to remember that part of participation um, is that we still have to have fun and the kids are having fun and they've gotten used to the masks. Um, and some may need to take more breaks. Um, in soccer, you may have to substitute more frequently. You might have to have some more uh, specific water breaks to make sure you're maintaining hydration. Um, it's gonna be weather dependent. There's so many factors that go into answering that question. I, I, I hesitate to, to give a, a blanket answer other than to really look at all of the conditions and, and do what's right for the individual. But at the end of the day, that participation with the mask is, is imperative to protect the health of, of all of our teammates. So we can actually get through all of these seasons and prove that we can move in, in inside to some of those other sports we're looking forward to in the winter. You know, all of you've talked about how adaptable and collaborative uh, we've been as a community and how resilient our kids are. And I totally agree with the mask, even for us in healthcare. You know, I'm debating sometimes if I want to wear the goggle and the mask or the face shield. And then even today, I got a little steam up with the bifocals going on. And so I really <laughs> tell, I know it's, it's horrible. And so I really tell parents, you know, we are getting accustomed to all this and wearing a mask all day. Um, so a couple of things, a lot of times parents always say, you know, what can I do to be supportive of our kids right now? Know that, you know, you can share information at an age appropriate level. Um, one of the things if they say they are uncomfortable wearing a mask, I said, wear a mask at home where you're just chilling, hanging out. Um, definitely if some patients are, you know, more anxious or nervous, or even for some of our cognitively delayed kids, we can work with parents on, um, you know, finding a particular mask or fit or what's comfortable. But I agree, finding what's working for the patient and what's working for the family. And I think the other thing is, as uh, someone mentioned it at the onset, allowing ourselves some grace. Uh, you know, we, you know, it feels like we've been doing this forever, but really this has been about six to eight months. And I feel like, and I know Russ is on the front lines with infectious disease, but sometimes I feel like information is coming out of a fire hose versus then at a drip of the faucet. So you're trying to keep up with what's new. Um, what should I be doing for our kids? And so I think the biggest thing is ask your primary care provider, um, if you're going on the online to look up resources, do things like look at Spectrum Health's website for reliable information. Go to the Center for Disease Control. And if you feel like your child is struggling um, too much where I've had some patients come to me and say, you know what, he or she's a little afraid about going outside. They're a little afraid about getting on the bus. Um, again, slow down, have those conversations, but also be cognizant of the messaging you're providing for, for our kids. We're all struggling. Um, and I tell parents also give yourself some grace. I, mm -hmm. I do not have little ones at home, but um, I can't only imagine of how to balancing, are we virtual, are we hybrid, are we going to school full day, half day? So that's one of the things I always talk to parents about. So giving your, giving yourself some grace and, and knowing that, um, 
I hate to use the word and this is, but you know, what is we're 35 minutes into, so I might as well say the new normal, which I, I promised myself mm-hmm. I wouldn't say, but this is a new unprecedented normal. Um, does anyone, any other thoughts about helping how we can support our children, our families um, during this time? I'm going to have a panel of experts, so I'm going to lean in on them as well. Anyone else? I would encourage reach out to their schools, to reach out to the classroom teacher or administrator. Uh, we have a team that support children and we work with them a lot throughout the day to help them come to terms with whatever they're carrying as they come to school uh, within their social, emotional or stress or anxiety. And so oftentimes by reaching out to us, we can provide what's working for us at school or at least we can partner and come up with solutions uh, so that we can be consistent. And the more structure and routines our children have, the more successful they're going to be. It's perfect. I totally agree. All right, we and have I another. Do, Go ahead. Um, just seek joy, you know, and find things that they can celebrate. Um, have fun with one another. Uh, make sure that they're, um, you know, engaged in fun family activities um, or, or activities with, you know, with, with, with neighbors. Um, just find fun. Uh, because there's a lot of it out there. Uh, it's it's right in our hearts and we can make it happen. I, love yeah, I think that's a great point. And, and I think that it's important that as parents, we, we watch the words that we use and watch the images that we're putting in front of our children. Uh, there's been a lot of fear and anxiety over the course of the past six months now. And uh, and kids don't always have a, a, a context in which to place what's happening. In fact, adults, we don't really have that context either. So being very careful about the words we're using, the uh, the images we're watching, and having those good, healthy, joyful conversations with uh, with our children. Great advice. I love it. I love it. Find joy, find joy, and be mindful of the messages we're saying. And it, again, it can be taxing for us. Um, you know, even myself. I was talking to one of my friends, and I was like, you know, this would be the time we would normally go on our trip together. You know, but really, kind of saying, how can we, how can we be together, and we're not on our girls trip. We're, you know, but sharing time and maybe just hanging out on the deck with each other. So those are great. Those are great. Finding joy and 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 good messaging. Another question that's come up in the chat is, um, and I'll open up to any panelists, we're hearing a lot about the upcoming flu season. Um, mm-hmm. How can parents tell the difference between flu and COVID symptoms? Any advice? And before you answer that question, is it too early for me to get my flu shot? So whoever, uh, Dr. Lamp, you want to talk to me about um, my flu I'll, shot? I'll jump in on that fast. No, it's not too early to get your flu shot. Go get it. I got mine yesterday. So um, yes, uh, this is a great time to get it. Most uh, studies show that you you have protection for at least six months from an influenza vaccination. So I would go get it uh, as soon as you can. I think getting a flu shot this year is gonna be even more important than any other year. And the kicker on this is that there's no good way to tell the difference between the flu and COVID. The, The symptoms overlap so heavily. So classic influenza, is a dry cough, uh, body aches, and fever. And those symptoms line up right along line with with COVID. And so I think it's going to be extremely difficult to try to tell the difference between the two. Um, There has been some some mention in the chat about testing shortages, and that's a reality that it's not easy to get a test. It's not always easy to get a test turnaround in the time that you want it. And so I think the way to keep your life from being disrupted is to, to make sure that you, you get that flu shot. And so that takes influenza out of the equation in your life. Okay. And my understanding is there's some offices in the community that are doing some rapid COVID testing as well, along with rapid flu testing. Can you, are you aware of that um, at all? I don't, uh, Adam, I don't know if you have any, any on that uh, info on that. There are some, what they call antigen tests. So there's a, a number of different tests that are, are utilized for COVID diagnosis. Um, the the tents that you've seen set up around town with cars pulling through, those are a, a PCR test and it's a molecular test that has to go to the lab and has to be analyzed. Um, there are some some more simple rapid tests that can be deployed, what we call point of care in an office. They're not quite as accurate. And I think this is something that probably as we move into the, into the fall and winter season, we're gonna have to figure out how we integrate uh, some of these tests that may not be as accurate, but more available 
and and where do we rank order them? I I, I know within within Spectrum Health we're looking at all options for testing to try to make sure that we can test as many people as possible, but also to do it in a way that's as accurate as possible. So I, I'm not aware of which which offices are doing that in particular, but okay. but that may be a practice that's starting to, to be integrated. Dr. London, do you have any thoughts? I just agree with what Dr. Langdon said and that, uh, you know, accuracy and scalability uh, are the major challenges right now with the true rapid tests. Uh, we hope that that improves in the near future. There's been tremendous technological improvements uh, in the recent uh, months, um, but right now, uh, what we have are, are the antigen and and the uh, the PCR testing uh, as really our, our best options. Okay, perfect. So I don't want to. We have about four minutes left. Oh, the time went so quick. Mm -hmm. Doctor Adler, any any thoughts? Any closing things you want to leave our our our, our virtual audience with? Yeah, you know, I, I think as, as we develop uh, our new normals and our, our stable environments, um, we continue, we have to continue to be flexible because change will happen. We're going to change seasons. We're going to go into more indoor seasons and, and what have you. Um, I would encourage people to rely on science and to rely on, on data from reputable sources. Um, and, and that is going to be the key to keeping our society healthy, our kids healthy, staying in school. Um, and, and being successful. And, and we, we've done a great job thus far this fall. I, I really think that we um, can continue and take this momentum into a, a difficult time of year. Um, and I look forward to, to helping the community face this challenge and, and being successful. Perfect. Uh, Dr. Katula, any questions or any f final thoughts? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think about how Dr. London was talking about how students aren't able to sometimes communicate uh, well and how they're feeling. And I, I do think it's an important point that I was going to add is uh, sometimes as adults, we have difficulty verbalizing how we feel. And so anything parents can do, um, similar to what uh, Scott had mentioned, providing the space, uh, providing opportunity for joy, celebrating because there still is a very much dark cloud on us right now living within this new normal and people long for what it was before it wasn't that long ago that this all started and so trying to be mindful help our our children to find the words or give them the space to share that information i also think it's really important that every day we know what it is today and we can't get ahead of ourselves because we don't know what's coming and we do need to be prepared for whatever comes and we will make the best decisions um, collaboratively and with one another's support and well-informed. We have an incredible network of collaborators in Kent County and Spectrum Health has been a huge part of that. And I'm grateful for everyone's support because we're going to need each other as we go through this year. Wow. So I, I I thank the panelists. I thank uh, you for your time and your energy and all your expertise. Um, and thank you all for joining us for Spectrum Health's first school health virtual series. And thank you to all our panelists for participating in tonight's dialogue on staying healthy during this school season. We plan to share the recording on our website, spectrumhealth.org, where you can find many resources to help you stay healthy uh, now and well within the school season. We look forward for you joining us in the future for sessions that include mental health and on le online learning challenges, flu versus COVID-19. Stay healthy and well. Thank you and good night. Thank you.